Good afternoon, everybody from UT Camp. We are happy to welcome you on our today's webinar. And today we are going to talk about localization engineering and about all the small and big ways in which language service providers can use terminology to make the translation process better for everybody. While we are waiting for the rest of the audience, please type any sign in the chat so I will be able to know you hear me well. So we are proceeding. And I need to say that we are broadcasting all our webinars on YouTube and on Facebook at the same time. Join us there and follow our official Facebook page so you can see the link in the chat window now. We are, read, we, we are really appreciate uh, your feedbacks, so you're welcome to share, like or comment on our videos. And of course, we are happy to invite all of you to, uh, to our UT camp 2019. It will take place on July 22nd, 28th. And it will be a whole week of presentations and workshops on translation industry trends, open air networking in Pine Forest on the river bank. In order not to miss any news about the upcoming conference, join our Facebook event. You can see the link now. And our early birth registration is in full swing now. Register for reduced fees by May 1st. Visiting UT Camp 2019 is a good reason to take part in the biggest industry event in Ukraine. To combine conference participation with family vacation or even work. To listen to a presentation by translation industry experts and see with to get some reboot. So just visit our website utsc.eu and apply as a participant. And we have just published our preliminary program. You will find more than 15 sparring speeches there, translation workshops, interactive games, professional networking, and roundtable discussions. Go to our website, check out the agenda, and register not to miss uh, early bird reduced fees, as I said, by May 1st. And of course, we would like to thank all UTCAMP 2019 and UTSC webinar sponsors and partners, companies and people who make this event possible. Thank you. And of course, in case you are interested in supporting UTCAMP 2019 too, you can find all sponsorship uh, opportunities on our website in Sponsors section. Our today's meeting is going to be hosted by me, Irina Wieser, UT Camp CMO. And now let me introduce today's speaker, Oksana Tkach. Oksana studied linguistics and worked as a translator and localization specialist at Linguistic Center and Blablacar. During this time, she shared her experience in the localization industry as a speaker at European Commission's Translating Europe Forum at UT Camp 2016. She later went on to study data science and computational linguistics and worked as a data scientist before moving on to start her own company called Metamova. Now it's time for me to turn it over to our guest. But before I do that, I want to ask all of our attendees to send questions in the chat window. I will ask them at the end of the presentation. Hello, Oksana. Hi, can Hi. you hear me? Yes, yes. Can you see me? Well. Yes, and we see you well. Good, that's good. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. I'm happy you all came over to hear me, hear what I have to say. I thank you for that introduction. Um, I've been uh, working in localization engineering for the past almost a year now, and um, I have some thoughts which I would like to share with you all. Um, I guess this topic got to be pretty popular uh, because nobody really knows what it is and I didn't know what it was before I started to work in this field. Uh, so I hope today everybody will be a little bit more happier because you will, you will, ha you will have some new information. Uh, so yes, um, maybe we can start, I can start sharing my screen now. Um, okay. So here's my presentation. Um, 
Yes, but let's talk about this. I cannot see you, so you can share your screen. Sorry, I guess uh, I I forgot to press the share button. Okay, now uh, I guess everybody is seeing my presentation. Uh, so today we will talk about the magic of localization engineering, what it means, what we do, and what we can do better in our industry. So um, the presentation comes to you in four and a half parts. That's what I say. The first part, we will talk about why you need engineering and DTP and all of this stuff, why translation is just not enough. Um, the second would be what we do in production, what we do every day, day to day in our work. Um, the third part, we will talk about what we what um, we doing and what you know our clients would like us to do, which is automate. And uh, the fourth part, I will touch upon computational linguistics a little bit and what role it plays in, uh, in translation. And the fifth part, I will I will sort of hint on at my ideas on data science um, to sort of and get a little bit of intrigue going on there. Um, but uh, if you want to hear more about it, you will have to attend NITIC 2019 in Dnipro and see me in person. OK, so let's start with why localization engineering is important. Uh, I will tell you a little bit of a story, a background. When I was a senior in college, my uh, one of the teachers at the fac faculty, uh, she got this big, huge project and it was this huge um, manual she needed to translate um, and it was in PDF and it was like, I guess it was a lot of money and she um, she wanted me to translate this job and she just sent me a PDF file, um, which I thought was a little bit weird, but okay, I uploaded it to MemoQ, I did my translation and uh, it didn't turn out really well because if you, this is, I, I did a test, I played with MemoQ a little bit, I uploaded this PDF to MemoQ I copied source of text, I exported it in, in PDF back, and this is what I got. So um, it's a very bad idea to send a PDF to a translator because uh, the, the delivery that you will get back will not be really good and your client will not be really happy. Um, so, and this is because we've been working with PDFs recently and we found out that PDF looks really good. It looks, it's kind of like a cross stitch picture, right? Like the picture you see right now, it all looks like really, really nice um, because it's prepared for printing. But if you look at the structure of PDF, it looks more like the back side of the picture of the stitch cross picture, right? And you really don't want to deliver to a client something that looks like that. So um, what actually should have been done uh, and why? So first of all, why, why I was working with a PDF as a translator? That's a really good question. I think uh, it's because there is a certain amount of naivete um, from language professionals that just um, either teach languages or do translations. They think the translation industry is, is sort of focused on the translation process, right? When you, when you see a sentence in one language and you try to express the same idea in other language, what actually is happening in, a, in the industry is looks something more like this. Um, so you have, and this is a very simplified structure, right? So you have your uh, project managers um, talking with clients, getting projects, but then you also need those files to go to DTP sometimes or to web development, need uh, engineers to extract the actual text that, um, that you need to translate and only then it goes to translation. And then you do all of this process in reverse after the translation. Um, so basically with DTP, with PDFs, you need the PDFs to go to DTP and then the DTP engineer needs to deliver something like an IDML file or a doc file or pages file so that engineers can work with them. But um, you really you really cannot skip all of these really crucial steps. Um, OK, so that's just a, kind of a, kind of a, a you know, story to get you inspired to, to find out about engineering more. Um, so uh, here's what we do day to day. Basically, our task in production, right? Production means you know, our, what happens every day, what we do to make the clients that come to us happy is to provide the translator with only the text. They have to translate nothing less, nothing more, and make sure the client receives something that looks really good, as good as possible. And sometimes it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, so for instance, let's take an example, uh, the website of uh, UTIC conference. Um, it looks really nice, right? The, the browser displays it in a nice way, everything is structured, you, you have pictures, you see only the text that you need to see, right, for a human. 
Um, but in, in fact, what the browser really sees um, is this. It's just a bunch of HTML text, right? Um, and what the engineer needs to do is to extract the human text, the text that the humans will see, and send it to the translator to be translated. So you know we don't need we don't want to send you all of these all of these characters um, because we don't want you to do the work um, of finding which text to be to translate. Um, and in fact, what um, what we want the client to send us um, this is the biggest basically the biggest misconception when somebody wants to translate their website they tend to like send us HTML pages uh, for translation, which I mean, I can extract this text from the HTML page, but um, it's just not the right way to do it. So the right way to do it is um, we want your project to have some sort of a internationalization layer. Um, and that is something that your web developer needs to do or the platform on which your website may be hosted. Um, sometimes they also have these uh, internationalization Features and that means that all your strings that appear on the website should be already extracted from HTML and um, put somewhere in a file like like a comma delimited um, file CSV or in a JSON or in a properties file or you need to have an option to export them in uh, either XLeaf uh, this is a translation industry format or PO format. Um, so you really don't want to don't want to work with HTML when you're translating when you are translating websites. Basically, what the translators, what what engineers um, do in production is we get these files and we try to put them in XLeaf, um, the the translation industry standard XML format, so the translators can see very clearly what needs to be translated and uh, put the translation where it needs to go. Um, and XLeaf is a pretty handy format. Uh, it's quite heavy because it has, you know, a lot of characters um, to sort of store. It's a lot of bytes, but it's really handy because when you when you're using a programming language, it's quite easy to access, you know, this tag transunit and then access the text source and in like three lines of code extract only the text that you need to be translated and then put the translation back here. Um, but in in real life, um, this looks really nice, right? Uh, you see only the text, the human text. But in real life, uh, usually what happens is we get something like this. Um, so we will have the human text right here, but uh, the string also contains some HTML code uh, right there. And so the uh, the task of the engineer is to make sure that the translator does not see this pesky HTML code in their um, in their file to be translated because they may either get confused and not know or like try to translate HTML code or um, mess up the HTML code, which in the, then later it will not display correctly. So that's something we also um, we also have to deal with. Um, another another interesting case which happens quite often is um, consider this message: uh, get our fifty percent off promo code. It has some. It looks like a, like a normal um, promo message that a lot of websites, a lot of companies would use, and it doesn't look like anything special. But in fact, when it comes to programming, it will display something more like this, um, which looks really weird and confusing. You got these weird percent sign as things. Um, but basically, what this tells this is the this is the programming language um, Python style of displaying of writing a string or printing a string. Basically what it says, um, take this percent sign S and replace it with this string, and then take the second percent sign S and replace it with this string. And this is really useful um, if you are doing internationalization for a website because you can, you, you can take these two values and save them as, uh, as variables. And then you can change them depending on the language. So for instance, maybe another market that you are targeting um, it has like, just the prices are different and you're not going to have $80 there, right? You're going to have $50. So it's really easy if you're using this placeholder format, it's really easy to later manage this. Um, but so you can see that the percent 
is like something that the programming language uses um, to process something that we are processing, right? But we also have this percentage sign that displays as a normal character, um, which gets a little bit more confusing because how do you display? How do you tell the Python? How do you tell the programming language that this is just a character? And the way to do it is to, to put it twice. Um, I'm not going to. It doesn't make much sense, but this is how it works. And so my work, my task as an engineer is to deliver um, this to the translator, right? I need these placeholders to not be changed or edited or moved. And I really need them to be in the translation. So I'm going to lock them as uh, a placeholder. And then I need this, these two percentage sign to display as one percentage sign as to make your job easier. So this is something that we do that day to day. We deal with, with uh, confusing strings like these. Um, and this percentage sign reminded me about this one podcast episode they listened to recently. The podcast is called Reply All, and they had this episode called The Roman Mars Mazda Virus. And it was about the fact that there's this podcast called The 99% Invisible. Um, and when this one guy tried to play it on his stereo in his Mazda car, it would break his stereo. But it was only this one podcast, the other podcast played just fine. And when I was listening to this right at the beginning, I, I thought it must be something about the percentage sign. And uh, if you listen to this episode, um, it's, it's really fun. They make, it, they make my job sound really fun, but they basically investigate what would break uh, the guy's stereo. And yes, it turns out that it's about the string and uh, you know about, about um, text that was supposed to be for humans. Um, but the computer somehow thought that it's uh, the, the, you know, the code that it should process and it just broke everything. So um, I really recommend you listen to this because um, if you want to sort of understand what engineers investigate day to day. Okay, the, the, the last point I'm going to make right now is about, I want to mention encoding. So encoding is always a huge problem if you uh, translating to many languages. If you have, you know, more than 20 languages, you have different alphabets. You have, you know, um, Cyrillic, Cyrillic, Chinese, Japanese, um, Roman characters. And uh, it's kind of impossible to handle it easily. Um, I wanted to show you this example. This is an Excel file that was sent for translation. And, we, and the result looks pretty good, right? Like we have, this will be um, like a format that a website will read and display this string for English, this string for Japanese, it looks nice, but it's in Excel and we need the client to receive CSV comma separated file. Um, and so when I tried to convert it to CSV, it looked something like this. And then uh, after, you know, two hours of work, I did something and I achieved this. <laughs> so um, you can understand that working with encoding in localization is really hard sometimes. And the reason why it's hard, uh, it's something like this. Basically, I will tell you about the background about encodings. Um, we used to have Unicode. It didn't cover all of the alphabets. So people came up with UTF-8. And UTF-8 should cover all of the alphabets. Um, so it's a really good, um, good rule to use UTF for all of your languages. But if you're working with Windows, this was Excel. Excel uses UTF-16, um, and uh, then if you try to save UTF-16 in CSV, it's going to not know what's going on. And then if you try to, you know, you, then if you actually convert the CSV to UTF-8 and open it in Excel, it will once again attempt to read it as UTF-16, and you will get these characters. Um, so you have to be like really, really careful and res really research your encodings before. Um, before you do some sort of internationalization for your project. Okay, so those were our basic tasks that we have to deal with. But uh, in fact, the bigger picture of, uh, of a localization engineer is to automate as much as possible because automation is supposed to save money, right? Um, and usually uh, process automation for engineers include coming up with an architecture for a workflow or like an architecture for a process for a particular file or a client. Um, and uh, the, the task of the of process of architecture, process automation is we want you to give us a file 
and receive the file looking exactly the same, just in another language, with minimum human intervention in between. Um, so it would be great. The life, like life, would be really great if we could just like take your website uh, and uh, have all of these scripts and all of these um, and all of these algorithms just do all of the work for us and just send the text translation to the translator. Um, I can't really demonstrate. I can. I cannot really show you workflows that we use for our clients because that's confidential. But Trados has a really cool example, um, and it's like in open access um, to demonstrate how workflows work. Uh, and in Trados, it's called task sequences. It's basically all of these tasks in Trados are um, algorithms and scripts that will uh, process your files. And what you do is you just stack um, you just stack these steps one on top of another in in the uh, in the sequence that you want them to run. So here what we are doing uh, in my selected tasks, um, we usually will take your original file, convert it to XLeaf format because it's a standard, then copy um, copy that file for all target languages that you have. We will uh, analyze files to do a word count. That's also an automatic task. Pre-translate them, so we will extract all of the matches from a translation memory. Um, somewhere in between here, human translation should take place. And after the human translation, we will update the translation memories with new translations and then export the files. And all of this is supposed to be automatic. Um, so yeah it would be really really great if we could just automate all of the things and something that we work on but in reality um it's really not always possible this is this is my phase uh, now after one year of working here i was so excited uh, to come in and uh, i was thinking we should just script all of the things and process all of the files but now i'm realizing that it's really not always possible which is kind of sad um and uh here's the reason why so computers, it's a very simple thought. Computers cannot distinguish um, between language code, language and placeholder, and all of this other stuff, right? Um, all of our, all the information that we feed to computers is just a set of characters. Um, and we, and you know, engineers need to know which characters should go to a translator and which characters should go to the computer. And uh, I've done some research on this, uh, I've researched can I train a classifier, like some neural network that will help me with this? But it's really, I've, I've discovered that it's really not possible uh, to distinguish. So look at this example. <clears throat> we have basically a set of characters, right? Uh, but a human will immediately see that, first of all, it's a JSON format. So uh, a, a, an engineer will parse um, this string as JSON and sort of block the JSON part. Um, so now we have, we blocked all of the keys that we don't need the translator to see. And now we have only this string. But that's not all, because the string again contains HTML. This happens a lot. And it's not, it's not just HTML, it's escaped HTML. So we also have these weird slashes that tell us, hey, this, this quote is part of the HTML, not part of the JSON. And we need to take that into account as well. And so the engineer will do the second step and block all of the HTML. But still, that's not all, because we have this weird entity thing. So these are basically character entities um, that browser will um, change to real characters so that the human that looks at your website sees a normal character. But in, in the code, it will look more like this. And this is a character for non-breaking space. Um, which will display as normal space, so as nothing. Uh, but we really need it to be there because now breaking space tells um, the browser not to move next text to a new line. So we need it to stay there. But we really don't want the translator to see it, and we don't want the translator to change it in any way. So what the engineer will do is we will further lock it as a placeholder and hope that the translator will put it in, uh, in the end there and not change it. And then once you translate this translatable text, we should get this, this exact string, but with the translated text. 
and unfortunately you will if i think you will always need some sort of a creative intervention from a human um to deal with tasks like these because it's really really not easy to explain to a computer how to do this effectively um and Based on this, uh, there's one really important thing I figured out in the past year is that you will basically spend 80% of engineering efforts and time from engineers on 20% of your files and 80% of your profits will come from the 20% effort of, engin of engineers. And that means that and that, that, that's the 2080 uh, rule or the Pareto principle that applies to very, very many things in life. Um, but that's the sad truth that probably 80% um, probably of your files will be processed very easily, but you will always have those 20% of files that just always need some, some human to look at them. And just based on that, um, based on that principle, there's one big advice I can give to you if you are an LSP or if you want to work with clients directly and not vendors, and if you want to receive source files and you want to process them yourself, one big advice would be the less source file types you have, the more automation you can achieve, therefore the more money you can save. And I mean, I'm not sure if this is, um, you know, super like a super ultimate advice, but uh, from my standpoint, uh, I, I, I think it's pretty important. Uh, so just to illustrate this, if you are a niche, say you're a niche um, LSP and you only do WordPress translations, so you only have, you only translate sites made on WordPress, then you will have to work with WPML format, which is basically XLeaf, but exported from WordPress. And you will have to spend like maybe a week automating all of the, everything you need to do. And then you will use the same automation process for all of your other clients and that will, and not, not in engineering. And that will translate into probably some profits. But if you decide to be like very, very client centric and take on all possible clients with all possible uh, formats, including, you know, WordPress, uh, doc files, Excel, um, iWork, Mac files, like pages, keynote and stuff like that, um, there will be, you will have just, you will need to automate everything or not, not just automate, you need to parse so many formats that a lot of your profits will go to engineering. So if you want to take on all possible formats, um, you either, you, you, need, you really need to make sure that you're, pro that you're not losing your profits uh, for engineering or that your rates are higher than, uh, uh, higher than an average niche agency. Um, yeah, so that was uh, on automation. I would also like to touch upon computational linguistics. I think uh, there is a huge presence of computational linguistics in the causation in, in the causation industry, in translation industry. Not many people talk about it, which is weird because it's a really fascinating topic. So um, just you know, when you receive a word count, if you're a translator, um, somebody analyzes a file and tells you, well, this is how many words we have. How does that exactly happen? Um, as humans, we see a word and we understand the concept of what a word is really easily. Computers don't really understand what you mean by a word. So we need to really think about how we count words for translators. Mm. So for instance, when I take English, is 47 two or one words? That's an that's a interesting question. Um, conceptually, it's one word, but for a translator, it's probably two words. I'm not sure. It's a, it's a decision you need to make or a decision you need to do hard code into your algorithm. Um, is he or I am one or two words? Uh, grammatically, it's two words, but uh, graphically, it's one word. And, uh, you know, once again, will the, how much effort will the, the translator spend on this? Um, what about German? German has really long words that sort of are stuck together. Um, and it's definitely not one word. So there, there are other algorithms for German that will look, that will split words, not by um, spaces, but by like suffixes. Um, so they will count this huge word as two words for a translator. 
Uh, what about Chinese? Chinese looks like um, basically Chinese doesn't use spaces. And uh, this looks like one, either one word or one sentence, but it's neither. It's actually several words that just are not separated by anything. And there are also in computational linguistics, different algorithms to do this. And it's true that that like programs like MemoQ or Trados do this already, um, but that's why they are so expensive is because somebody already did it. So, you know, but if you like, I think um, their pricing is kind of crazy. And if you don't want to pay, you can just hire a computational linguist and they will write you a word count algorithm in, you know, in a month or something. Okay, uh, sentence splitting is something that's used in translation a lot. Um, because we work with translation units, right? We don't really uh, receive a huge file, but we don't receive blocks of text, we receive basically sentences. Um, and that's also a big problem in linguistics. Like what, how, um, how, do we sp how do we decide where the sentence ends? So here's a sentence with a quote. And this quote is a sentence on its own, and but it's separated by a colon. Should we think that the colon uh, signifies the end of the sentence? That's a really good question. Um, this sentence um, is basically two full sentences separated by semicolon. Also, should we show the translator two sentences, two translation units, or one? Mm. Or sometimes Trados will break your file by the paragraph tag. So it will say, okay, let's take the whole paragraph as a translation unit um, and not separate it as two sentences by the simple period. And all of these decisions need to be made and all of them were probably made by computational linguists. Uh, and the problem in, uh, in linguistics is, is called sentence boundary disambiguation. And there are also very many solutions, very many algorithms for this that are just ready out there that you can use and implement. Um, and why why sentence splitting is important? Uh, we'll consider this this case. If Trados uh, breaks your file by paragraphs and then stores the translation in the tr translation memory as a paragraph, but then you have a new file to translate, and you break it by just period, you will have these two sentences that were already translated, but your um, match but you will see a 50% match because it will try to match this string with this string. Um, and it's only half of the string, right? Uh, and you're, you will end up losing money because you will end up, somebody, somebody will end up retranslating these two sentences. So it's, it's a pretty important uh, part of the localization business. Okay, um, another important thing that we, that, we do, that we do a lot in our everyday work is um, finding and locking non-translatable or, or substitutable text. So basically something that the client doesn't want to be translated or that something that we can easily just substitute later and not pay for, um, for translator efforts. Uh, so it's something like, um, something that's easy to find and easy to replace. Uh, stuff like dates. Um, dates, you can basically, you can, People use it usually either want them to stay the same or they can very easily um, change the format, but you don't have to send it to the translator. Sometimes it's cheaper to lock the dates and replace them later. Um, something like links. Links are important because we don't want you to receive them as just a plain text because sometimes you will like accidentally delete a character uh, and the link will break and that's, that's not great. So it's much better to find the link and lock it and then localize it, let the web developer or the engineer localize it instead of the translator. Mm, stuff like emails, the same, the same with links, we just don't want you to break the emails. So we have to write a script or an algorithm that will find all emails and not send them to the translator. Um, stuff like addresses, maybe you already have address translation or you want, to, when you want it to stay in English that's understandable. Stuff like names um, as well. Sometimes you want them to block, to be blocked. Um, sometimes weird text is extracted is extracted for translation. Um, so, for instance, like names of files for some reason end up in translation, and that's something we also really need to find and block because we don't want you to see them and we don't want to give you more 
extra work. Um, we need we want you to receive only the stuff you need to translate. Um, and the the solutions, the ways we do this, um, are pretty pretty simple. Um, we usually use regular expressions. In uh, computational linguistics, it's like the the the, the basic, very main uh, way to solve most problems is regular expressions. Um, and sometimes we use gazetteers. Gazetteers is basically just a list of most common, let's say, country names, human names, um, date formats, so that we can, you know, match, say, Auckland. Um, if we have a file with all possible city names, and Auckland is in there, that we know that it's probably a city, and we don't want, and we want it to be locked. Okay, uh, glossary tech. This is my uh, favorite topic. I have not seen a lot of people do this, but it's a really cool thing to do. Um, you can find or extract glossary terms automatically using this algorithm in computational linguistics called TF-IDF, which basically means um, it's term frequency multiplied by inverse document frequency. And uh, it's, a, it's a basically a formula. Um, and what it does, it finds you the words that in general are used rarely, but in this particular document that you're analyzing, it's used um, frequently. And that means that it's a it's an important word for this particular document, and you should probably look at it and probably add it to your glossary. Um, I found this really cool visualization, and I'm, I'm adding the link so you can later go check it out. It's an NLP engineer. This guy creates this really nice um, visualizations with words and language. And so he basically took two files, Alice in Wonderland and Price and Prejudice. Uh, and um, you can enter any word here. He used find. It's not a great example, but it's visually, it looks pretty good. Um, so you, you can you can look, okay, how many times does find appear here? How many times does find appear here? Maybe the word find is more important in the Price, Pride and Prejudice file than in this one. And so we, we should probably pay more attention um, to this word in production. Uh, and I really, I really like this idea. I wish we would. Um, I wish more LSPs and more vendors were using uh, TFIDF to manage their glossaries. Another cool thing uh, for glossaries we can do is um, is lemmatizers. So I, I'm sure a lot of you, if you are working with glossaries and automatic glossary checks, I am sure that you have seen this before. Um, for languages like Ukrainian, uh, for languages that are synthetic, they have a lot of different forms of one word. In English, English is an analytic language. It usually has one or two forms of a word. And, you know, additional information is just added. You add additional information by adding more words, right? In Ukrainian, you will just change the actual word. Um, so the current algorithms that are doing the terminology check will only check for the you know for the the main form of the word and it will give you a lot of false positives so here there is nothing really wrong with this translation but on glossary check it will give you a false positive and will tell you oh this word is not translated actually in the translation which is not true we could use lemmatizers lemmatizers are basically uh, these engines or algorithms that will take a word and they will use morphological rules of languages to generate automatically all possible forms of a word um, without you know any additional human work and in that way if you are if you are using a different form of that word in the translation it will actually be caught and be seen and will, will count as you know as correct translation and show you why way less false positives. I think this is a really cool, cool idea that more um, more cat tools should, should should be using. Okay, so this is my my last slide. I've told you about what we do, um, what we what localization engineering is all about. But I think um, that in our industry. We should be um, we should be looking into data science more because translation industry is a data rich industry. We are literally 
trading information, languages information. And um, we and you know there are very very many cool applications that we could be using, but we are not um, because we are looking more at you know delivering a file instead of um, instead of improving something like your your own neural machine translation. And there are very very many um, cool recent advances. For instance, you can now fine tune neural machine translation. You can take clients' translation memory and fine tune an engine to and sort of to adapt it to that client's needs, and that will probably need way less post processing. Um, and there are other very many cool things. I don't have time to talk about them right now. I will talk about them in Dnipropetrovsk uh, at Lutik 2019. Uh, I will ex I will basically expand this one slide to one hour speech or forty minute speech, and I will also talk about more about how transition businesses should be integrating big data best practices into their business. They should be handling their transition memories in a different way um, and uh, why and how we are basically siloing our data and why we should be sharing it instead because it would benefit us all in very many different ways. And I will also talk about why machine translation will always need human translators because um, because we need to keep it up to date and we need to keep it better. Uh, but all of those things, that's, that's just a li little preview for you. Um, unfortunately, we really ha have no time to expand on this right now and um, probably need to, need to, uh, need to finish uh, the presentation at this point. It's already 45 minutes. Okay, so if you have any questions about anything I talked about, um, Please ask them if anything was unclear. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for attention. Thank you, Oksana. So thank you for showing us all the you know, internal kitchen of uh, localization engineering. So all of us, we're, I think we feel a little bit of <laughs> like localization engineers now. So yes, we have a uh, couple of questions. Uh, so, we won't uh, let machines do all the work for us in your future, yes? <laughs> oh, definitely not. It's, uh, <laughs> I would say it's, it's pretty impossible from, from where I'm standing. From my admittedly limited experience data science, but I do know some, some things about it, and it doesn't look like everything will be taken over by AI anytime soon. So. <laughs> Okay, so uh, do you think uh, we will have uh, some situation in the nearest future when we won't need uh, to translate from scratch at all, but only using the post-editing? Oh, yes, definitely. I think that's, that is exactly what will be happening. The difference is either the, the MT engine, engine the, uh, yeah, the MT engine will adapt to your particular style of translation or to the needs of that particular client or that particular field. So you won't feel like you need to add it so much and you will it will feel way way more natural. But um, I mean it doesn't it, I don't think it will touch um, like art translation or definitely not poetry and stuff like that, but for like your everyday translation tasks, I think it will you will just get more done. I don't think you will get less work. You will get the same amount of work, you will just be doing way, way more content. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, we are also asking you to share uh, some information about the tool uh, for checking the tone frequency. It's it's really interesting. Oh, TFADF. This is my uh, idea, which oh. is not. Yes, I I definitely I've definitely seen it done customly for clients. Um, I don't think it's public. If uh, I'm not sure if there is a demand for it, it's something that needs to be checked. But mm -hmm. I would, I would love, I would love to make either like a free demo somewhere online if if you want to use it. I because I've been thinking for a long time that this would be really cool if we could use it um, publicly. Well, actually, you can show it at UTIC uh, during your speech, right? <laughs> Wait, what do you mean? When you're going to Utica, oh. yes. Oh, definitely. definitely. I can I can prepare something. <laughs> yes, <laughs> great. 
So as for now, uh, actually, we don't have more questions. So uh, thank you very much for your speech. And we'll see you this summer. And I invite all of you, uh, dear uh, listeners uh, and attendees of the webinar, to visit UT camp. Um, and I'm moving on with uh, my other slides. So I say goodbye to Oksana for now. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thanks for attention. Um, yeah, if you if you want to catch up, you can you can connect with me on very many different social media. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. See ya. See ya. And we will have uh, our um, next webinar on May 16 and talk about uh, uh, with uh, Stanislav Och, what a, a DTP specialist on how to convert PDF uh, to prepare it properly for translation. The registration is already open on our website, webinar.utic.eu. We store all the UTSC webinars and speeches uh, in video section on our website, utsc.eu, so you can watch them for free. And you're always welcome to subscribe our YouTube channel. Uh, we publish our videos there and you receive all the notification about the latest video. To know how to stay in touch with us, find us on social media. We always list them on our video descriptions. And now we kindly ask you to give us some feedback. Here is the form to let us know your opinion about this webinar so uh, we can improve our work. We don't say goodbye as we will already meet you soon. See ya.